This is the moment you've all been waiting for. The real estate market is shifting from a seller's market to a buyer's market. There will be some significant deals available to us as investors. The question is, are you going to be able to negotiate a deal and get it done? Or will you sabotage the deal with your behavior and your actions? In this video, I'll break down five things that can kill a real estate deal and tips you can use to avoid losing a deal. Stick around until the end of the video where I'll share a hack on how you may be able to revitalize a killed Deal. Hey, what's up? Darren Voros here. My mission is to help you reduce your real estate investing education time from months to minutes. Subscribe not to miss what's coming. Number five, extending the conditional time. In a real estate deal, if you have conditions on your offer, there'll be a set timeline for those conditions. For most real estate transactions, this is usually somewhere between a week or two weeks. Extending that conditional time is often not a problem, depending on when you bring this up with the sellers. The reason it becomes problematic is that a lot of investors will bring this up at the 11th hour. And when a seller is expecting you to potentially remove conditions and go firm on a deal, you do the opposite and ask for an extension of the conditional time. This will generally anger or frustrate the sellers. And in some situations, they would prefer to kill the deal versus extending the conditional time. My tip is to bring this up as soon as you're aware that you may need an extension. Even if you don't move forward with the extension, at least you gave them the heads up that you may need it. It's also important to relay to the seller why you need an extension. If they feel it's a valid reason, they'll usually be more inclined to agree. If it's simply because you're disorganized, that's not really a legit reason to ask for one. Number four, trash talking the property. I've been inside of a lot of disgusting properties in my day. It's hard to imagine that people actually live in these properties, but it doesn't matter what the state of the property is. The owners still feel a sense of pride in the property or at least a sense of ownership. Trash talking a property, even if it is in significant dis repair will not yield the response you're hoping for. Novice investors will try to use this as a negotiating tactic, thinking that if they trash talk the property, they'll get a better deal on it. All it does is pisses off the seller and will usually kill a deal. You don't have to flatter a property owner if their property's in disrepair. You can use phrases like, your property has some deferred maintenance that will need my attention. Or we'd like to do some upgrading of the systems and finishes. This will relay to them that you'll be trying to negotiate, but saying this property is a piece of junk will usually kill a deal. The only exception to this rule is that if the sellers themselves are trash talking the property, but even then I'm reluctant to jump on board. It could be a situation where it's okay if they say it, but not if you do. Number three, being inflexible. Novice investors believe that the only thing that is important to a seller is price. Price is usually the number one factor in negotiation, but it's not always the most important. In some cases, the closing date may be more of a factor. And I've also seen things like the deposit structure and conditions time play a major role in a seller's willingness to accept an offer. By being flexible, you increase your chances of getting a deal done. If the closing date, deposit structure, or the conditional time is not a huge deciding factor for you, but the price is, then do your best to give the sellers what they're hoping for on these items and let them know that price is of significant importance to you. This may feel like you're showing your hand, but generally it works in your favor. But by digging your heels in on all items and being inflexible, you will most likely kill the deal because a seller will feel there's no flexibility in your negotiations and that it's very one-sided. Number two, being adversarial, or in other words, being an a-hole. Just because you're looking to buy something and somebody's looking to sell something doesn't mean you have to be a jerk about it. In my experience, if I can build a relationship with the seller and I become likable to them, there's a higher likelihood that I'll get a deal done that is a win-win for both parties. But if I'm being a jerk because I think that being a hard nose is a better negotiating stance, it usually has the opposite effect. Some sellers will negotiate based on emotion and simply simply refuse to give up certain items out of spite. You don't need to be best friends with a seller, but if you can build a relationship, your chances of killing a deal over small items gets reduced significantly. Before we get to number one, let me take 15 seconds to share some exciting news with you. My new and improved real estate investing masterclass is now live. This is the most comprehensive real estate investing training on the market today. Whether you are just getting started as a real estate investor or you've got an existing portfolio of properties and you're looking to take things to the next level, this masterclass 
will help you get to that next point. There are over 30 modules covering everything from how to negotiate a deal and what clauses to include in your offers to how to find off-market deals. You'll also get access to my team of professionals, various spreadsheets and analyzers I use in my business, and you'll also get three months of live group coaching with me for additional support. Check it out at darrenvoros.com. Use the promo code YouTube for $200 off. And now the number one thing that kills real estate deals is a low ball offer. One of my mentors taught me that if the sellers aren't slightly offended by your offer, then you haven't gone low enough. Yeah, I disagree with this strategy. I've killed many deals because I've come in with a low ball offer with the expectation that the sellers would counter no matter what I put in front of them. But in some cases, they didn't sign it back with a counter offer and weren't willing to negotiate after my initial low ball offer. There's nothing wrong with a low ball offer, just back it up with reason. As an investor, this is a very easy thing to do because we are making offers based on financials and not based on emotion. So if you make a low ball offer, make sure it's backed up by numbers and then you justify your approach versus just pulling a number out of thin air because that's what you want to get the property for. As promised, if you have killed a deal and would like to revitalize it, I suggest the following approach. Give the seller some time if that's available and approach them with a humble apology. Admitting that you may have offended them in one way or another does not lessen your negotiating power. If anything, it will humanize you and again, helps to build rapport with the sellers in an effort to be in a position where you can put the deal back together. Ultimately, you're still in the driver's seat as to whether you wanna move forward with it or not, so apologizing or admitting fault will not harm you in any way. And if the sellers are still not willing to negotiate, you're really no further behind than where you were before. And now I'd love to hear from you. Is there something you've done to kill a deal? Leave it in the comment section below, along with any real estate investing related questions for me. You can also follow me on Facebook and Instagram where I post regularly. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you on Tuesday.